Ya Allah, we ask you to bless this gathering and bless everyone who's attending this gathering and give tawfiq and success in the work that MCC and all of the organizations are doing to serve the needies uh, who are coming from uh, a land that's been in uh, dire need of help for the past four decades. Amin Ya Rabbil Alameen. First of all, I just wanted to thank Sister Amina who has been, uh, I've been in contact with her um, often in the past few months since the refugee crisis. And she's been such a tremendous help and such a blessing to have uh, in our community. May Allah bless you and give you tawfiq and success in all that you do and everyone around her, because uh, it's always there, all those, those people who help out. It's not a one man show and one woman show any of these programs and projects. So uh, I, I really appreciate everybody's help because uh, I, I, uh, one of the thing about refugees is that we forget that we are all refugee. Uh, our grandfather, Adam salam, was the first refugee. The first man on this planet was a refugee. He, was, uh, he came from paradise into the earth to do time. And as a refugee, he came to this earth. So being a refugee is, is nothing new. And Adam salam, was, was searching for, and he was alone on this planet by himself with no help. So, and then, uh, cause he lost his wife, Hawa, and then they found each other in Jabal Rahma in Mountain of Mercy. And so from then it has been part of the tradition uh, of, uh, in, in the journey of the human being that, that we have been becoming refugee from one land to another because uh, the earth, the all of the earth is, a, is, is, is the land of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So wherever you go, it's like it's like a chessboard that no matter what move you make, you're still in the chessboard. So wherever we go, we can't get out of the uh, of the land of Allah because it's every everywhere you go, it belongs to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It belongs to God. So people, you know, travel out of uh, it with with uh, uh, for a, for a vacation, they go from one land to another. But there are those who actually they don't have a choice to leave. Um, and if you look at the, the situation where uh, the people of Afghanistan, and you can you can name many countries that that are going through similar uh, tragedies, but Afghanistan is right now is what people are are are, are uh, looking at in the news. Over forty years, uh, it's been really. Um, I mean, I, I grew up in in Afghanistan, and I grew up uh, during war most of my life. And one of the, the, the sad thing is that a lot of people in this country, they never have experienced uh, the, the real story of the people who lived in war. Uh, for us, it's kind of like a movie because we've seen a lot of movies of wars and we think it's cool, but it's really traumatizing uh, growing up in, in a place where bullets are coming and you don't know if you're going to live uh, throughout that the day that you're um, that you're that going to school or, or, or even picking up groceries from the local grocery store, you might get shot and, and die. And, and so a lot of these people are looking for a place of safety. One of the... Every human being is in search of happiness. They just want to be happy. They, like It's not like all these people, they want fame and they want glory and they want America or they want Europe. Or they, most people, I mean, when we came to this country, we came, we just, we just, wanted, we just wanted safety and happiness. Uh, and I think every child deserves to have a, you know, a place where they can call home, a place where they can feel safe and feel at home and feel happy. And, and I think that uh, um, for us, what we are doing, and this is one of the, a lot of people say, oh, you guys are doing such, helping the people and we have to praise you. This is what everybody's supposed to do. We're like, this is every human being on this planet. They're supposed to do this. We're supposed to help those who are in need. And this is now we're living at a time that when you do the basic human action, you're actually praised for it because nobody's doing anything. And 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 I and I will be very short because I, I don't even know how much time they give me. I think five minutes, but I it might I might be over my time. But I'll, I'll just read some lines from the great uh, poet of Persia because most of these people who are coming, they're coming from Afghanistan and they they speak this beautiful language of poetry of of uh, Persian. 
And in this poem, Saadi, who lived uh, 800 years ago, he, he talks about human being as a family and, and what does it mean to be a human being? This definition is so amazing that it actually this poem is hanged in the United Nation uh, as well in, in, in New York. So he says that Bani Adam azai yak digarand ke dar afrinish yak gaharand. He said humanity, all of the human being on this planet, whether they are from Africa, whether they are from Persia, whether they are European, whether they are white, black, yellow, whatever color they are, whatever race they are, whatever gender they are, all of human being, he said, they are like one body. Imagine all of humanity as one human being, as one body, one human. He said, because if you look at the essence of the human being, they're all from the same essence. We all bleed the same blood. There's no green blood and yellow blood and white blood. Every blood is the same color. We all, it's the same. The spirit of every human being is the same, regardless of their color and their gender and their, you know, their, 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 their class, right? So he said, we are all from the same essence. And he said, when one part from this whole body is in pain because of the circumstances of life. He said the entire body would suffer from that pain. Just like when we have toothache, our entire body suffers when just the tooth hurts. But why is it that our head, our arms, our hands, our, our stomach, our feet, every part of our body is suffering when we have a toothache? He said, that's how human beings supposed to be. When one part of this body, this, this body that we call the human, the human being, the human family is in pain and suffering. He said, all of the body will suffer. The entire body will suffer. And it should suffer. If it doesn't, there's something wrong. He ends this poem by saying, oh, you who are free from the pain and suffering of other people, you don't deserve this amazing title of human being. Because this title called the human being, this is a gift that God has given us, that we are the crown of creation. We're the best of creation. And we are called the human. People go to a uh, to school to get a DR in front of their name to be called doctor, right? Seven, eight, nine, ten years they study after their high school and, and after university, and then go to graduate school and they'll get their master's and get their, uh, you know, get their doctor degree, right? To have a DR in front of their name or to have a PhD in front of their name. But Saadi is saying the greatest title that you can carry it's called the human being. That is the greatest title. That's above all of these, above the, the DR, above the PhD, to be a human being. And he said that humanity is when you are in pain and suffering, when somebody else of your human fellow is suffering. Doesn't matter if, if they're suffering in Africa and people don't have water to drink and you can drink water here and you can waste water in California while knowing that people are dying because they don't have access to clean water, there's something is wrong with us if we do that. Something is wrong. That's what, that's what Saadi is saying, that we, we have lost a portion of our humanity if we don't care about the suffering and the pain of other people. And this is, this is important to keep our humanity. That's why we are helping. That's why we are here to help those people who are in need. Yeah, because... The wheel of fortune is, is turning. We might be on top right now, but one day we might be at the bottom and need the same help that these people are getting because we don't know life is like a play and there are curtains and we don't know what is the next curtain on this play. Is it a tragedy? Is it a happy uh, scene? Is it a, a war scene? We don't know. This is the nature of, the, uh, of life. So well, let's help these people whatever we can. And I want to thank each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart because I, uh, MCC helped uh, the, the one house that I was a witness from beginning to the end on how they did it from the, the beauty, the Ihsan, 
just the way everything was done, the people that brought this stuff to the house, uh, the, 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 each individual, one was more, more beautiful than the other in their character, that these people who are receiving these gifts, they were just in awe uh, of 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 uh, of the people who brought these gifts to them, but they they brought them the mattress and they brought them the 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 beds and they brought them even towels for the bathroom and all all these essential needs that they need that they. But it wasn't just a gift. I I'm telling you, some of these people like this family that uh, some of these families that were helped, they were they were like kings back home. They lived like kings. They had servants. They had like. Ten bedroom homes that, but then they packed and they they didn't even pack. They just left without anything, and they have stuff there, but they can't do anything with it. It's kind of like you know, the, the, you know, one of them said he said I'm a I'm a millionaire beggar now, and he started laughing and says I'm a millionaire beggar. I have millions of dollars worth of stuff in Afghanistan, and I'm begging here because I can't access to it. I don't have access to it. I can't do anything with it, and I came with. And they even took my backpack. At the airport, I came with a plastic bag. They say, whatever you can fit in this plastic bag, go uh, leave. So there, there are those people, they're really in need, most of them. Uh, the, it, but again, I, I, I'm always in touch with Sister Amina because we also don't want to be taken advantage of because there's always, you know, there's, there's in every time and every society and every community, you know, like Clint Eastwood said, there's the good and there's a bad and there's the ugly. So uh, there's no society that's free from that. So we have to be careful in, the, in, in one of the things that I really appreciate about MCC, that they're really vigilant about really helping people to the degree that they need help until they stand on their feet and, and let them, and let them uh, start their life and, and move forward. But thank you very much. God bless you for everyone who's helping on these projects. And may God give you a thousand times uh, of what you have done uh, for these people. I mean, Luzdeth Raidun, Jazakallah Khair, thank you so much um, for these wonderful words. Um, I think now we just want to go over a little bit of the history um, of the partnership with MCC and um, service, uh, San Ramon Valley Islamic Center. Um, when the uh, recent Afghan crisis started, uh, the two organizations decided to partner together. Um, and I'll give a brief uh, kind of overview of MCC, and then Sister Nadia will talk about service. Um, MCC's contribution to this partnership is mainly the food program. Um, prior to COVID, we started off in a tiny little closet, um, and now, mashallah, our pantry has grown. Um, it started with COVID. Uh, we started serving 16 families, and now, mashallah, we are up to uh, over 250 families that we're serving every two weeks. Um, we are distributing produce, staple items, and diapers to families in need. And um, this is now including the Afghan refugees that are coming in. Thank you, Sister Amina. Assalamu alaikum. So as our VIC started our refugee support program in 2005, but with Sister Chloe and Sister Sophia leading the effort. So between the year 2015 and June 2021, our refugee com support committee actually in partnership with IRC furnished 63 apartments complete with all household needs, including furnitures, household um, staff, groceries for all refugee family. And currently, since uh, August 15, MCC and SRVIC has come together because we realized the crisis is bigger than what any of us can do it alone. And we rallied together and we have jointly provide support, coordination to support the incoming displaced people. So Stamina, you want to take the next slide? Um, yes. So um, MCC is providing the biweekly food distribution um, we are also coordinating hot food for the family so that when they arrive, um, they, reserve, they uh, receive a hot meal um, cooked by one of our community members. Um, we also have a car donation program that has been in existence for the past several years. And um, we are currently accepting donations of used vehicles that are in good working condition. Uh, for the refugee families as well once they receive their driver's license. And we also have a, um, 
a Eid toy drive that goes out to our Zakat families um, every year and it's organized by the MCC Girl Scouts troop. And SRVSC is also providing household goods to set up a home for these refugees. Jointly, MCC and SRVIC has provided since August 15, furniture supplies needed for ad nine additional apartments and often with 24 hours turnaround time. We have also developed a pool of drivers. Very thank you to all the volunteers who have stepped forward to deliver food, household items to the families. We have also prepared infrastructure to match volunteers for transportation, visits to government agencies, translation, school registration, and driving license. We have also recruited social workers from Alameda and Contra Costa County to answer questions and serve as resources for us. So since August 15, we have served 17 households referred by IRRC, 37 households referred by JFCS, totaling a total of 102 individuals through apartment setup, welcome family hygiene packet, grocery, hot meals, and bike donations. We've collected more than 506 donations from our Amazon wish list, and donors have generously responded to calls for specific donations and dropped them off at MCC and SRBIC. In terms of cash donation and gift cards, we have co collected so far a total of more than $6,000. Okay, so now I want to introduce the three organizations that we are partnering with and supporting. Um, we will start with the IRC, which is the International Rescue Committee, um, and we want to welcome um, Jordan to the panel. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you so much, everyone. Um, so first of all, I'd like to just say a huge thank you for having me on this call today and uh, really uh, couldn't do the work that we do without MCC and without the partners and the community members that are that are here. Um, it's been a really busy time. And as you've heard uh, from the numbers just shared, MCC has supported full housing setups, uh, donation drives, kits. I mean, we've had, you know, the list goes on uh, an, an incredible amount of support. And uh, literally this support we talk about all the time with our caseworkers. Uh, it is life-saving for, for our families, but also for us uh, trying to provide the services. Um, so my name is Jordan Tofiri. I'm the uh, director of the IRC Oakland office. I've been with IRC for a little over two years now. And uh, my role is to oversee the operations uh, of, the, of the office. I'm really glad to participate in this call because I've heard raving things about Chloe and her team. Um, our, our resettlement team depends on this uh, partnership so much. Uh, so it's really great to see some faces here and, and to be here. Um, I wanted to provide a brief update on some of the numbers uh, of the arrivals and then talk a little bit about what we are seeing uh, through IRC resettlement program in terms of uh, the arrival statuses. Um, so since July 1st, we have received 115 individuals uh, uh, or 38 cases. Um, of that, um, of that total, we've seen a combination of uh, refugees, um, SIVs, so special immigrant visa holders, and then a, a sort of a new categories that um, that we're calling parolees. And I'm I'm not sure. I'm sure a lot of you have heard a lot of information out there. It's been quite confusing for us too, as the uh, resettlement agency uh, staff. So I wanted to kind of give a brief overview of what, you know, the different categories are um, and, and what the services look like. Uh, so as you probably all know, the special immigrant visa holders are the folks that worked for the U.S. Uh, government or were government contractors in Afghanistan for at least one year, um, and the visas cover the, their whole family. The refugees that we are seeing uh, also include some individuals that have worked for the U.S. government or government contractors, sometimes less than a year in Afghanistan, um, or they worked for maybe a U.S. funded program uh, or project, um, you know, or fleeing from other um, sort of categories that would qualify them as refugees. And then the parolees are individuals that have pending applications uh, as uh, special immigrant visa holders. So individuals that were in the process with their family of getting the SIV uh, uh, application and, and visa and had to leave um, uh, for safety reasons. 
We also are seeing a category called humanitarian parolee, which uh, this final category are individuals who do not have a pending application uh, and who will most likely seek asylum uh, when they come to, uh, to the United States or, or once they're here. So with all these three categories, um, the services and the needs are, are the same. When they get here upon arrival, uh, we need to provide housing uh, as quickly as possible. And we've been allocating uh, as many resources as possible for temporary housing, uh, but unfortunately the, the resources are limited. Uh, we've been mainly uh, getting Airbnbs and hotel stays for families, but we are trying to build more partnerships with landlords that really understand uh, our family's experience coming to the country with no credit history, with no employment history, limited references, and trying to get an apartment and, and sign a lease. So that's been the, the toughest part is, is finding uh, these landlords in the community that can really understand uh, the experience that our families go through. Um, for all of these individuals, regardless of status, they... Um, as uh, Mr. Mojadidi, I think you eloquently put, you know, no matter who it was, they're all human. They're all coming here with, um, you know, your message was really important. They're all coming here with the clothes on their back, whether or not they had resources back home, uh, you know, they're arriving with nothing and they have to start from, from the ground up. Um, so our role uh, as the resettlement agency is really to, to, to help them integrate as well as we can in the community, especially around community members that they feel a connection with. Um, and to help them to, to rebuild their lives here from the ground up. Um, so aside from housing, food, which uh, we talked a little bit about the food distribution, um, that's been a high need. Um, housing setups, we cannot thank uh, uh, Chloe and her team enough for the, the full housing setups that she's been doing for our families, 17 uh, so far, and the need is going to be growing. Um, so that, that's, that's an incredible support that we have. Um, it, there's been so much community support with donations, but there's also a, a challenge with a space and storage. Uh, so having a partner being able to go in and do full housing setups is just uh, phenomenal. Um, other needs as they integrate is just, you know, community connection, uh, being able to connect to the local mosques. So, you know, thanking the, the Muslim community out in Alameda County and Contra Costa counties um, for, that, uh, for that connection. Uh, being able to support the women, especially, who feel particularly isolated right now. Um, oftentimes having the men in the family with more language skills, uh, more English skills. So, you know, trying to figure out ways to really integrate the women um, and, and, and the children. So I'll leave it at that. I know that um, time is limited and, and I wanna um, allow for Fazia, I think, to go next and speak to JFCS Cispe. Yes, thank you so much. And the partnership um, with the apartment setups has been wonderful, um, a great experience for us. And um, Fauzia from Jewish Family and Community Services is up next. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you so much, Brother Freydun. Uh, this poem is one of my favorite poems and very powerful and meaningful. Thank you so much for sharing this. And thank you so much, Jordan, for giving that raw information about resettlement agencies and the services that we are providing. So I'm not going to repeat all those uh, information and resettlement process that uh, Jordan mentioned here because we are uh, providing the same services because we are the same resettlement program and our services is also kind of providing those services from picking up the families from the airport to apply for social security cards and connect them with public benefits and uh, navigate them through medical system and um, and all those core services are part of the resettlement program for JFCS East Bay as well. Um, uh, to go over our numbers, Jewish Family and Community Services uh, served uh, as of uh, June 1st up to now, we served 131 individuals. And that's the, just six individuals are from Burma that is are all from Afghanistan. And uh, these families are a combination of uh, special immigrant visa holders 
and parolees. Um, uh, just to add uh, with what uh, Jordan shared, I just would like to tell you guys the routes that we are getting families. So um, our normal uh, cases coming through our headquarters. And those are either if it's a special immigrant visa holders or refugee population or parolees, um, they are all coming uh, through our headquarters. They are assigning case to us. And afterwards we are receiving their travel info. And then we kind of come up with a reception plan. And of course, with the support of our partners, usually we set up and staging in a house prior to their arrival and making sure that all the arrangements uh, made for the families. But uh, some of those families are coming um, by their home and they are being called as a walk-in cases. That could be a special immigrant visa holders or could be a parolee uh, a status families. Um, uh, after cobble clubs um, that, and after that emergency evacuation, uh, all those families were transported uh, through uh, emergency charters but some of those families were allowed to accompany their family members who was US citizen or they had um, permanent residency documents. So they joined their family members and they came to our community and they are uh, in our community right now. Those are the families that are a little bit at disadvantages because for them to get connected with resettlement programs and other partners and agencies, it's take a little bit of time and for us as a resettlement agency to be able to serve them, it's also taking a little bit of time for us to send their case, um, uh, apply for benefits and wait for their case approval and to be able to provide services. So in these cases, we have seen that MCC, other partners, uh, they are doing a tremendous job holding all those families with their needs, providing um, hot meals and uh, fresh groceries and also helping families with gift cards, clothing, um, and all those donations has been made, which is great. We really do appreciate that. Um, uh, and uh, for past uh, few weeks, we have a lot of families that are um, uh, humanitarian uh, parolees status um, that they came as a walk-in case, they reached out and they were trying to get support from uh, resettlement agencies. Unfortunately, we were not um, able to take their cases on because we didn't have any guideline and instruction from our headquarters. As of last Friday, uh, Jewish Family and Community Services got a guideline and instruction on how to submit um, benefits for walk-in cases. So if you have families that are being here as a walk-in case, uh, regardless of their status, if they are a special immigrant visa holders or they are refugees or their parolee status, just reach out to us. Uh, we can apply for their benefits and send all their documents for the settlement process and benefits. And they are all qualified for um, all the services that our regular cases that are coming through our pipeline are qualified. So in terms of benefits, there is no difference between any of those um, populations. And in terms of resettlement program, the, um, these both population, uh, SIV, refugees and parolees are qualified and eligible for the same uh, financial support and quite similar resettlement program. There are a little bit uh, differences in terms of providing the core services, but in terms of financial support um, and the funding that uh, coming through a federal grant for them, the amount, the same exact amount, there is no difference. Uh, so just reach out to us if you have any of the families that are willing to be connected with resettlement agencies, we will be more than happy to help them and support them. Um, and just I want to take the opportunity uh, to thanks um, all our partners and uh, committees that help and support um, Afghan population through this crisis. As uh, Brother Freydun said, um, for Afghans, it's been more than 47 years uh, to be um, a country that is being in a war. And we all kind of... Um, the generation that we are seeing right now, they are all grow during the war. Um, an unfortunate situation that happened recently and this crisis that these families are coming, um, 
there's a lot of emotions involved. Uh, they are terrified. They are uh, there is they um, they fear and they left uh, they left their loved ones behind. All those challenges that they are coming, the the needs are so significant. If it's even in terms of needs of mental health, if it's the needs of any financial support for them to be able to cover the high um, housing costs in Bay Area. And of course, for them to be able to, to start their new life. Um, uh, they left their houses of dream, uh, the houses that they built uh, from their hard working money for years and years. And now they are starting from a scratch. Um, at, and it will take time for them and the healing process will take time. So we really appreciate the support of our community when still we are hopeful that the support will continue. I think we all of us have a long way to go. Um, this, this crisis will continue and, uh, and, and we are really here for it, but still we are relying on our community support and I really wanna appreciate that. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Fauzia. Uh, next we have Kelsey from Catholic Charities. Hi, thank you so much. Um, okay, it looks like you can hear me, right? Okay. Um, Salam, thank you so much for having me. I, uh, I really appreciate being included in this discussion tonight. And I want to thank all the speakers who, who went before me. Um, you guys are doing such amazing, incredible work. And I know it's been a really, really exhausting, busy time. So thank you. Um, just to echo those last words, I we also are just so appreciative of all of the support in the community, especially um, MCC. You are always so very welcoming to us. And I know uh, we had a bit of an emergency situation last week. And Amina, you not only spoke to me once, you spoke to me <laughs> multiple times in the day and we're communicating throughout the weekend. So we're just so appreciative of, of our partnership. Um, my name is Kelsey Coplin. I'm the community coordinator for the Refugee Foster Care Program, which is run through Catholic Charities of Santa Clara County. I've been in the role for over four years now. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of what we do because it is uh, very different, actually, from the other um, resettlement agencies that you've heard from tonight. And then I will go into from there talking a little bit more about this specific um, situation that we're facing right now. Um, we resettle uh, unaccompanied refugee minors. So we specifically are working with children, minors who are under 18, who are refugees, who have lost um, for various reasons, who have lost or been separated from their parents and guardians. So uh, we're not dealing with families or adults, we're just working with the, with the minors. Um, these are children who come to us from directly from refugee camps and other kinds of you know, refugee settings from all over the world. Uh, they are approved for resettlement in the United States, but because they are minors and because they've been separated and are no longer with their families, we have to then put them into foster homes. So along with being a resettlement agency, we are a licensed foster family agency with the state of California. Um, and we, are certifying homes all throughout the Bay Area through eight counties, including Contra Costa and Alameda and Santa Clara County. Um, so the, the youth come to us, we put them into foster homes, and then we actually work for a really long-term vision really closely with the foster families to support the youth and the families on an ongoing basis with continuous wraparound services. Um, everything from mental health care support to help with the schools, help with all legal and naturalization processes, um, kind of the whole range of what you could imagine as part of a youth's life, including family dynamics and, and everything. And we have a pretty, we have a pretty big staff. Um, and then even though they have to be under 18 to join the program, we actually are able and, and very fortunate to support the youth well into their early adulthood up until age 24, sometimes even 25, which we're really grateful for um, because it allows us to really stay with them and accompany them through that transitional age that can be so hard um, to make sure that they are in school and 
working and really um, more prepared to be independent and self-sufficient by the time they, they leave the program. Okay, so that's a bit of an overview of what we do. Um, now, how that relates to what the current situation is. Uh, it has been told, confirmed to us that there are over 200 unaccompanied minors who are in um, who, you, on U.S. soil. We believe at the U.S. military bases. They are not in our custody yet. Um, so I just want to make that clear because it's a common misconception and a question we get. Um, uh, traditionally, there are sort of two channels that youth, uh, similar to like unaccompanied youth who have come from other countries go through. Um, and right now, the Afghan youth are sort of in that other channel. However, we were anticipating that um, they, they're being processed through the help of UNICEF and other agencies um, that some of those youth would eventually come to us. There has been recent uh, legislation that, again, we don't, there's a lot of question marks, we don't know for sure, but it is seeming that we are anticipating that actually the youth might start being referred to our programs much sooner. Um, so, you know, our, our, our need is, 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 is urgent. We want and hope as much as possible to have foster homes to put youth in that do reflect the cultural and religious backgrounds of youth as much as we can. Um, that said, we are running a new, you know, this pretty lengthy approval process. We need to follow all mandates and rules and regulations from the state of California. Um, and of course, just we want to make sure that homes are safe and are going to be successful where we're placing children. Um, so we have a pretty in-depth approval process, but we have a next our next round of uh, training and process starting up for new parents next week. Um, if you're interested, some things to know. Uh, we are really looking for long-term homes, people who are willing to make more of a long-term or permanent commitment to youth. Now, we don't know for sure what, what we'll find. Some youth, uh, it, what, for, by all reporting, it was very, very hectic during the evacuation. So some youth may have family that will be uh, identified and they will be able to reunify, which of course is um, the number one hope or goal. Uh, but that said, most of the time, and certainly in our history through other crises, um, we really are looking for long-term term placements that can create a very stable, uh, consistent home and sense of permanency for youth. Um, another thing to note is that um, there can be no more than six children living in a home. That's just a a bigger role that comes from the state. So uh, that's something to consider as well. Um, and also, oh, of course, to consider if you have, uh, I know so many people have room in their hearts, <laughs> but also uh, if there's room in your home, the, um, a youth would need either their own bedroom or to share a bedroom with other children, but they would have to be the same gender and close in age, uh, typically within five years of age. Um, Another thing just to note that, uh, you know, again, we don't know for sure what, what to expect in this case, the children are not in our care yet. Um, but typically in the past, a lot of times unaccompanied minors are teenagers by the time they come to us. Um, so again, I, I don't know for sure, but usually it's teens. There's a big need always for families who are willing to take in teenagers. Um, which I know teens of, from anywhere in any culture can be uh, a bit of an in, like intimidating to consider, but um, the youth in our program have been through a lot. They are quite amazing with their resiliency. Uh, and you know, we believe that all children are deserving of love and care. So we, we humbly ask you to consider teens as well. And on that note, um, similar note, we, we do see a mix and we anticipate that there will be a mix of both boys and girls, but we do 
often have a large need for, for boys. And I know that taking in teen boys um, can become a more complicated matter for some households, um, but it is a big need of ours. So we ask you to please consider uh, and think it over if your home might be a good fit for that. Um, okay, that's my big, my big request for foster parents. It's always our biggest need, but other ways too that um, you, you might want to be involved. Um, we, of course, are looking for support with language, um, translation, interpretation, especially when youth first arrive. We want to make sure they understand that they're safe, that they have rights. Um, there's certain paperwork that we go over. So we definitely are anticipating a big need for um, Dari and Pashto uh, language support. And we also, um, sometimes we understand that some families are not in a position to be full on foster parents, but uh, if, especially if you think that you could offer some sort of cultural support and connection to a youth, we're also looking for individuals and families to just act as an extra, you know, loving friend from the community that can either help support the youth or maybe even support the families that we have. Like if we have a youth placed in a home where the parents are not the same, uh, do not share a cultural background, but uh, maybe someone else in the community wants to teach them some recipes to cook or about certain holidays or um, any, you know, any other way to be a friend or a support to a foster family, that is something we're also looking for. So thank you very much. Um, I'm just looking through my notes. I think that's all I have right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all so much. Um, we wanted to take a few questions for IRC and Jewish Family and Community Services. So if you have any questions for them, please type them into the chat. Um, they are, some of them are in a different time zone and can't stay too long because it's very late where they are. Um, we do have one question. It says, um, could you please tell us how many refugees you're expecting in the next six months or more and what amount is needed for each family? So I have Gauzia or Jordan, I'm not sure if you wanted to answer that. Uh, for Jewish Family and Community Services, our proposed number for FY20, FY2022 is uh, to resettle 290 individuals, and that's in combination of special immigrant visa holders and refugees. And also, in addition to that, um, we propose to resettle 120 uh, parolees. So in total, we are, uh, our proposal for FY2022 is to resettle 410 individuals. Um, and uh, what was the, ne the next part of the question? I'm sorry, I didn't get the next part. How much is needed for, for each, for these families or for each family? The needs in terms of like financial support? I, I'm guessing it's financially what it would, what amount is needed as each family is getting resettled by your organizations? Uh, so technically the amount that they are qualified for the question is about the um, RNP fund or the APA fund. Each individuals are qualified for $12.25. So that's, if you're a family of eight, then 12.25 times eight. If you're a family of seven, then it's times seven. For folks that are single and families that are small sizes like family of two and family of two, three, it's a little bit kind of uh, tight because they are also uh, eligible for the same amount of financial support. And that amount is resettlement, um, RNP fund and also APE fund. But also in addition to that, they are qualified for a public benefit. So uh, as of last Friday, we received uh, approval that uh, refugees, special immigrant visa holders, and humanitarian parolees, they are all qualified for all public benefits, cash aid, car fresh, and medical as well. Wow, that's really great news. Yeah, that is. Um, okay, so another question is, what can high school age people do to help out with IRC and Jewish Family Community Services? 
So on our end, um, th thank you for, for that question. On our end, we've had um, donation drives, um, um, hygiene kits, uh, uh, you know, activities. Uh, sometimes younger folks are able to uh, not only get the items and do the drives, but put the put the items together. Um, we've had some groups that have done uh, welcome cards uh, for new arrivals that we then give when we give a hygiene kit. So there are a few activities like this that we can that we can set up. Um, when things were um, when arrivals were a, a bit slower, we were able to have um, groups of students coming into our office and actually doing some of the, these activities on site and sometimes meeting some of our families. Right now, because of COVID uh, and because of uh, just the rate at which people are arriving, we're not having in-office activities like this. But with that being said, um, high school groups can still participate in these things, uh, you know, at their high school or elsewhere. Um, we have a. Uh, um, Volunteers from all over, and while we can't take on directly volunteers that are uh, under 18 years old, there are faith-based groups that might have kids uh, participating in their volunteer group, um, and so th that's another way to help as well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. You can feel free to keep um, putting in questions, and uh, we will continue now. Um, with our next set of slides. We wanted to thank um, our partners um, and those that have been supporting us. Um, so we have the Thrift Station um, located in the Tri-Valley area and they have been supporting us with clothing and household items. Rewire Community has been supporting us uh, with uh, hygiene kits that are, believing, uh, that are part of our apartment setups for the families. Um, the Alameda County Community Food Bank has been a huge partner for the MCC Food Pantry, not only providing food and produce, um, but recently through a grant, um, we were able to purchase a cargo van that will be used um, with our food pantry and also in the help of the apartment setups. Um, bad, bad business bike models um, in Castro Valley um, secured uh, eight bicycles for a group of uh, single Afghan brothers, um, all living in the same home. Um, that was a huge help for them. And the Afghan American Community Organization, um, their website is there um, and we'll post it in the chat for you. They've also been huge uh, supporters and partners uh, with the food pantry. And I think next we will move on to um, apartment setups. Aslamu alaikum. Hi, everyone. Um, so for apartment setups, we typically get a turnaround time of, um, sometimes we get a week, but now we're getting shorter turnaround time, like 24 hours. And if you could click on um, the list, you can see what the things we need. Um, sorry, can you, whoever's doing the slide, can we go back to the slide, please? Um, if you click on the link that says things on the top, yeah. I'm sorry. We will show you a list um, later after this. Um, basically, what we need to do is um, we actually, re currently we're taking things from two lists. We have put up an Amazon wish list for everyone who wants to donate. And you can go to the Amazon wish list and we will list currently what are the items we, we are missing in our apartment setup. The other place is um, once we open up the link, you can see um, hang on. Okay. You should be able to see on the link, right? What are the items? Item marks and asterisks must be new. So um, we please, please, this is just a sample of the items we need. Do not drop off items prior to contacting us. We do not have capacity to store any of these items. 
on site. So before you buy anything or drop anything, please contact us at refugee at mccspay.org. Um, can we go back to the slide? So we have, yeah. So we'll be providing this deck to you at the end of the day and um, everyone on the call will get the deck so you can see the list, okay? And uh, for the apartment setup, we do we, we utilize the view you volunteer groups to help organize and sort surprise the supplies as they are received at MC service, SRVSC. And we also look for volunteers to drive the donation to the family. So like earlier, Ustad Faridun says that a family receive um, household items for setup. So what happens is that we pack the items at service. Mm -hmm. We collect items at MCC as well. We put them together. We call the volunteers who are on our mailing list. Or we, what's, we have a WhatsApp group currently and we will post, we need volunteers to deliver supplies from MCC service to this location. It, we said Fremont or or currently conquered. And then uh, the, whoever is available, they'll say, I have a van, I have a car, I can take supplies to this location. And once we confirm the volunteer, we then uh, provide the addresses to the volunteer directly. So uh, we don't share the information of who the, who the recipients are or the addresses until we confirm the volunteer and it's only on a one-to-one -one basis. But um, the youth volunteers do typically come in on a Saturday morning or afternoon to help to sort and pack the supplies as we receive them. So a tip on um, donation, if it's chipped, scratch, stain, or something that you have at home, if you, if you can't use it, it's probably not a good idea to donate it. Just recycle it or trash, trash it. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, Chloe, over to you. Sister Chloe, over to you. Salam alaikum. Yes, salam alaikum. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so alhamdulillah. Um, so we are, uh, I'm going to talk about two aspects of furniture donation. So the first one is what we are providing to families. Um, and these are larger furniture items. So what we are required by the government regulations to offer is beds. And this is basically full size twin, which could include depending on how many people are in the family and space, it could be individual bunk or trundle. Um, and then sometimes cribs. We, we have to always provide new mattresses. So even if we can get used bed frames or cribs, we have to still provide brand new mattresses um, for hygiene reasons. So we also provide dining tables, chairs, and sofas. Um, those are things that need to be provided. We love it when we can provide some kind of storage, whether it's dressers, wardrobes, nightstands, something like that. If we don't have donated furniture from the community, instead a family just gets um, you know, a plastic drawer set, like a little itty bitty plastic drawer set. So imagine trying to store anything in those, right? Um, floor lamps are often useful because sometimes people are in apartments that don't have overhead lighting. And then things like coffee tables, entertainment centers, shelving, desks, things like that. Um, if we can, if we have the capacity to provide those to families, it's great. It really is a, uh, it's dependent on what's being offered at the time and, um, and whether we have uh, drivers <laughs> to drive things to people. Um, I see a question about air mattresses. I mean, that might be fine for temporarily, but um, obviously that's not something that um, people are gonna want long-term, right? So all of the furniture donations that we take should be in like new condition, similarly to what Sister Nadia was saying, if it's chipped, scratched, stained, broken, or wobbly, it is probably not a good idea to donate it. And um, we really are trying to give, uh, we're trying to make homes for people that we would want to live in ourselves. So I think um, Sophie just posted the link for donating furniture. If we could go to the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about the process. So the link that Sophie just posted is um, what you would use if you have furniture that you want to donate. It takes a little bit of time for us to get back to you. We do try to confirm that the furniture is in like new condition and also the availability. 
Sometimes people are like, I'm moving out this weekend. I, I need it taken within the next three days. Sometimes that works out. But that's just like by the will of a law. Do we happen to have a family and a driver that uh, is able to drive things within the next three days? We can't make any promises like that. If you have the ability to hold on to things for longer, then the probability of us being able to use your furniture is definitely higher. So what we do is we confirm that the items are in good condition. We, uh, when a, re a potential recipient family is identified, we show them the furniture through the photographs and we confirm that this is something that they want and mostly whether it's something that would um, fit in their home. Because again, a lot of times we have uh, larger families and very small apartments and so space is really of a premium. If the furniture donor can actually transport the item, it is wonderful and it's very much appreciated. But most of the time we don't have um, you know, that offered to us. And so instead we have volunteer drivers who we contact to coordinate logistics for pickup and drop off. And um, bear in mind that neither of the two massage at MCC, uh, can you go back for a minute, please? Neither MCC or service have storage space for large furniture items. So um, similar reasons we can't, large bulky sofa sets, sometimes we can use them, but not necessarily. And sometimes what'll happen is we split them up. So maybe it's a big sofa and then a love seat Maybe a family of three might benefit from the love seat and another family of four might benefit from the sofa. I realize that's not always convenient for people when they're moving and they want to get rid of their furniture, but um, sometimes that's kind of how we have to uh, operate. And, and yes, we do provide uh, tax receipts um, if that's beneficial. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I believe that in the link, um, we are, uh, you, you see the, the chat, the WhatsApp group to volunteer as a driver for furniture transport. I would really encourage everybody to, uh, if you haven't already, to sign up for our main volunteer list because um, if this is the WhatsApp group specifically for people who wanna drive. So if you wanna drive furniture and that's all you wanna do, then alhamdulillah, you know, you're welcome to only do this. But if you might be interested in other sorts of activities too, then you can use the link that um, Sister Sophia just put into the chat. And then we know that you have a variety of interests. It can also be helpful too, because we can try to coordinate if we know that you're in Concord and the, and the family that's um, having things being brought to them is in Concord, you know, we can try to coordinate that kind of thing too. So for drivers, pickup trucks and minivans are especially helpful. Um, sometimes a smaller car actually can work if we're just moving on some boxes. Um, MCC will soon, inshallah, be getting a van, which is provided by a grant from the Alameda, Alameda County Community Food Bank. And the main purpose of that van will be the use for our volunteers delivering food and furniture. So that's going to make it a lot easier for our volunteers to be able to take larger items. So thank you very much. And uh, inshallah, I hope you will consider this role. Next. Sister Sahar, you're up next. Um, hello, everybody. Assalamualaikum and good evening to all of our panelists and to all of our attendees, everyone that's tuning in to our webinar this evening. Um, my name is Sahara Mahdi, and I am one of the head volunteers for the MCC Food Pantry. Um, I started out as a volunteer last year, right at the, you know, during the thick of COVID um, during March of 2020. Um, just like Sister Amina mentioned, you know, we went from a small closet to being partners now with the Alameda County Community Food Bank and um, are able to help more families in need, um, which is a blessing in itself. Um, so in regards to food donations, um, you know, the uh, in the slide right now, these are typically just, you know, common things that um, I'm Afghan myself. So these are things that Afghans will consume and are preferable um, in the non-perishable section. Um, it's spices, um, rice, you know, um, things like beans and lentils, and of course, um, you know, oil and tea. Um, 
are things that they would definitely use um, in terms of refrigerated and um, halal meats. Uh, we do have uh, two large restaurant style refrigerators and one large freezer that we have in our mosque at MCC. So we would be able to store the meat and the dairy and produce if donated to us. Um, the only thing, um, yeah, so um, like it says on the slide, um, shelf stable food that's been expired, please compost it. Food donations can be dropped off at MCC. Um, it can also be dropped off on Tuesdays and Thursdays as well um, at our address. Um, another thing that's been done for the Afghan refugee um, food drive um, has been organizing a food drive, um, one of our panelists um, had a food drive organized um, at her daughter's high school and uh, they set up one of those canisters um, and they were able to donate food and that was subsequently brought over to MCC where we store it and then as we get the request to uh, prepare you know these um, food boxes for families we are then able to do so. Um, next slide please. Um, if we'd like, to, if you'd like to volunteer, um, that is our Google form um, that will, you know, you just put in your basic information and then we'll be able to keep in contact. Um, we, some of the things that volunteers help us do, um, we prepare bags of produce and staple food items um, for our food drive, which happens every other Saturday. Um, you know, breaking down boxes, assisting with the cleanup that happens towards the end of our you know, um, food pan uh, food delivery services, which ends around 1 p.m. Um, you can help deliver food back to the families um, or help pick up free food items from um, the church in Livermore or Windmill Farms in San Ramon. Um, so yes, volunteers can definitely do that. Um, and now with um, the Afghan refugee families coming in, um, we also can have volunteers come in and prepare these large um, food boxes for them, which include those staple items such as rice, oil, tea, etc. So um, volunteering is definitely um, a great thing at our food pantry and we definitely appreciate all of our volunteers. Uh, next slide, please, um, Sabine and Shazia. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Sabine Asifali, and uh, I've been a volunteer with MCC for quite some time. And with that, I'd like to thank all our panelists and all, all our participants tonight uh, for giving us your time on a Thursday busy night, alhamdulillah. Uh, with that and uh, with everything, I'd like to start with the hadith uh, of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that the best of you are those who feed others. and. Uh, with that uh, comes the fact that uh, the people that are coming in, the refugees that we are welcoming in, uh, and uh, as they come, we our intention over here is to feed the creation of Allah. And Bismillah. Uh, with that, I'll say uh, this: uh, this is more about uh, preparing a hot and a fresh meal as our guests arrive into this country. This is going to be their very first meal as they enter this country, and. Uh, and uh, as travelers, as visitors, we all know that uh, when you're traveling and uh, with this, the, you're tired, you're, you want to get home, you want to get into your bed, you want to get some rest and before rest will come uh, a hot meal. And SubhanAllah, this is going to be one of the ways to serve your creator. Uh, this group of uh, volunteers are named as Hot Food Warriors. And we call this group of volunteers warriors because the request for hot meals come with a very short notice. And subhanAllah, our volunteers have always been very generous up, up and about with all the zeal and enthusiasm to really come up with a meal and uh, uh, ready to feed, alhamdulillah. Uh, you can volunteer to cook or you can even volunteer to have it catered from a local halal restaurant. Uh, delicious meals to welcome the families as they arrive, alhamdulillah. Uh, the way we would like, uh, we basically have a few bullet points here down for everybody who, who would like to volunteer for preparing the hot meal. 
Uh, meals can be packaged in individual containers or large trays for the family to share. We usually, uh, on our end, whenever we are asking a volunteer to prepare a meal, we give them the number of uh, family members in that family. That way it helps them to prepare. Uh, we kind of will try, or I would say that we do mention uh, if there are any young children in the family. So we make sure there's not, um, uh, not spicy food and uh, typical meals will include rice, meat, and vegetables with yogurt or salad accompanied. Meals can be dropped off at MCC and delivery will be arranged, or they can be dropped directly to the arriving families. Tips, obviously not too spicy or oily, not leaking through the containers. And a couple tips for the drivers, making sure your uh, food is nicely packed and uh, secure, no, no food dripping no spilling, alhamdulillah. And uh, it's always lovely to have a little bit of a disposable paper place, silverware, napkins in uh, in the entire package. So uh, obviously the apartment will be set up for them, but uh, figuring out what goes, uh, where are the plates, where are the spoons, uh, none of those questions. So uh, the food arrives and uh, it's ready to be served. And uh, Shazia, do you have anything to share before I uh, share something? Yeah. No, you go ahead. That's what so, we all needed. And alhamdulillah, one last thing I'd like to say is that uh, serving others through feeding is definitely a source of sadaqa jariya. And this, uh, it's basically a sadaqa on your end. And it is always very important that those who cook uh, have a deep intention to cook, eat and share food for Allah's sake to ensure this action is spiritually meaningful and that we reap its rewards in the year after. So uh, one of the most uh, profound and beautiful ways to uh, serve the creation. Thank you. And uh, last thing would be that I did share the WhatsApp chat link uh, down there uh, in the chat for joining the WhatsApp group for the food uh, hot meal prepar preparations. But uh, we would also look at ways to share that link. If you are interested uh, in joining that group, definitely click on that link and that way you are up to date uh, with uh, how and what needs to be done. Thanks. Thank you, Sister Sabine. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, uh, IRC has had a buddy program um, to help the refugees. And we are trying to um, work towards implementing a similar program uh, for the incoming refugees. So arriving refugee families are taken care of by one of the local refugee organizations for the first 90 days after their arrival. They help each family with paperwork, uh, temporary and eventually permanent housing. Once the 90 days ends, some families, especially those without family or friends already established in the area, have more needs. As a buddy or mentor, um, there are two options. You could work with one family um, for approximately three to six months. So yes, this is something that requires um, someone who has time to dedicate to this one family. Um, and you will help fulfill their needs and help them better adjust to their new lives or you could help some families with a very specific task. Some families coming into the country, um, they have someone in the family that already speaks English. Um, they might have family or friends that are already here. So the needs that they have are not as, um, they're not as severe as some of the other families that might be coming in that don't speak any English and uh, they don't have any family or friends already established here in the area. So some examples for what we are considering to have the buddies do would be uh, driving lessons. Um, and again, this is a choice you would have to make because obviously the refugees don't have their own vehicle. So you would have to agree to allowing that uh, refugee um, use your own vehicle, um, helping them with school registration, um, driving them to uh, appointments, translating for them, showing them how to use public transportation, um, touring them around the neighborhood so that they can find where are the halal markets, where is the masjid, where are the other doctor's offices, other places that they have to go to, um, or helping them with resume writing and job applications. Um, next slide. Okay, so speaking um, Dari or Pashto, 
um, is a plus, but it's not required. Um, as we mentioned, some of the families are fluent in English. Um, so we have two volunteers that are gonna kind of take the lead um, with the buddy program. Um, Sister Yusra will be our buddy liaison and her role will be to assess the needs of the families, um, match them with the buddy um, and set approximate end dates. So both the family and the buddy are clear about the time uh, or length of commitment the assistance will be available. And then Sister Nia will be our buddy mentor she will meet uh, and advise the buddies in regular Zoom sessions, um, establish times that she's available to um, work with the mentors, offering them support and guidance throughout the duration of the mentoring relationship. And the mentor will also have access uh, to two social workers, one that works in Alameda County and one that works in Contra Costa County um, with lists of resources and things like that as well that will be shared with the buddies uh, to make this um, as easy of an experience um, as possible for everyone involved. Okay, next slide. So uh, can we go on tips on donation, please? The next, okay. So I think, thank you for spending time with us, but I think what we have to say to you is this. If it's an item that's chipped, scratched, tamed, broken, expired, these are things we really cannot take. And you know, if you cannot use it, we really can't use it. And if you're holding, if you have big household items like king bed, king beds, queen beds, or big um, sofa sets, big dining table, it's going to take us a really long time to find homes for them. And king bed is almost is never be used because they literally cannot fit into an apartment's uh, bedroom that we have for the refugees. So, so these items, perhaps you can sell them and donate the money to the program if that's how you want to you really want to contribute, okay? And do not drop off unsolicited donation items at MCC or service. Even if the item is on the list, if you do not contact us and let us know, and we do not agree to it, we cannot use them. And we don't have storage for them at MCC or at service. Next slides. Agree to it, we cannot use them. And we don't have storage. Okay. And on tips on donation, we are not collecting clothes at the moment. We do not have space for clothes and we will. We are not planning to collect clothes at both MCC and SRVIC. Please do not drop off clothes to us because we will have to put them in the recycling bin. We cannot take clothes at this point in time. Okay, next slide. So if you have, um, if, if you have other capabilities and expertise, you can consider volunteering at one of these other organizations who are also providing support for the refugees. Next slide. Uh, so this slide provides all the links to the volunteer opportunities and donation opportunities that you have seen in the chat. All of you who are on this um, webinar will receive the slide deck so you don't have to busy copy down at the, the, the links. Okay. And that's all. Uh, Sister Sahar will take us through the closing prayers. I think we wanted to ask um, first if anyone has any questions that we haven't answered in the discussion as we went through the slides. If you could post them in the chat, um, then we'll be happy to, to answer them. Okay, so here's a question. Have we identified needs for mental health services? Um, yes, we have. Um, and we have two organizations um, that um, are serving the needs for mental health. We have the Khalil Center, uh, which has been in the area for quite some time, and they are currently doing um, Zoom sessions for their clients. 
um, and we can refer any um, Afghan refugees coming in that may need mental health services, we can refer them to the Khalil Center. And we also have a new um, mental health organization that is just getting started called, called uh, Maristan, um, that's being leaded, led by Dr. Rania Awad. Um, and as soon as their organization is up and running and they're able to accept clients, we will also refer them to Maristan as well. And uh, both of these organizations are supported. Both of these organizations are supported by MCC. I can take this question. Um, do uh, we only work with refugees from Afghanistan? Um, overall, we've we've always worked with um, many different uh, refugees that have come. Uh, just nowadays, obviously, uh, the, the need is Afghan refugees, but we've never uh, only worked with certain uh, families from certain uh, areas or even certain uh, religions. We've always um, helped through IRC or any of the other organizations. And then as far as the time commitment, uh, that's another question that was asked. So the time commitment um, can actually be anything that is easier for you. It could be one time, it could be weekly, it could be a monthly, whatever you whatever you can give, even if you can drive and donate furniture, uh, donated furniture one time, that will be helped towards our organizations, all the organizations. And I just wanted to clarify that um, MCC and service, we're all volunteers. We actually don't take any overhead for any of the, the, the money donated. Um, so th that was another question. And then also I wanted to let you guys know that uh, we've been doing a refugee setups uh, through service and MCC since 2015 and before COVID, we had the opportunities to actually go in, we would wash the seats, set up the bed, set up the apartments, you know, really even sometimes clean them with different volunteers, even bringing in some youth um, with their parents or even classrooms, uh, classes like homeschooling co-ops or things like that. But unfortunately with COVID, we don't have that ability anymore. We generally just drop the items and the families um, set up the apartments themselves. Um, I think those are the only questions. And if you're, another question was if I'm only free on the weekend, actually uh, in the past, uh, the weekends actually were, it wasn't easy to help because we would be working with IRC, which uh, they work Monday through Friday. But uh, because of the crisis, we've been, we sometimes get a 24 hour notice on Friday and we are setting up on Saturday. Um, the turnaround time is very short. So sometimes I feel like people, there's so many people who want to volunteer and it's hard for us to give people the opportunity to give back. So please do be uh, generous with us because we do try to follow up with all the people who've signed up on the Google form to volunteer. Um, and we try to give everyone the opportunity to help, but it's been really hard to try to keep up with a really quick turnaround of help and then also including others to help us along the way. So, um, yeah. Sister Sahar, if you'd like to lead us in the, um, in the closing. I will um, recite um, Surat al uh, as a closing dua for our program. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa al-Asr illa insana la fi khusr illa ladina amanu wa aminu salihati wa ta'asob al-haqi wa ta'asob al-sabr Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yusifun wa salamu ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for your generosity, all of your donations, all of your support. Um, as Sophia said, we are working through the volunteer list. Continue to reach out to us at refugee at mccespay.org with any questions that you have. And we are doing our best to include all of you in this wonderful effort. And we thank you so much for all your support. Continue to make to offer us and any suggestions or questions you have please feel free to contact us. Thank you for attending tonight. And um, as Nadia said, we will send out the deck and all of the links so that you can reach out to us and sign up for the different volunteer efforts. 
Thank you very much. Jazakallah khair.